My name is uh, Pernilla Glaser. I'm an innovation developer at the Swedish Exhibition Agency and I'm here at Nida Art Colony. Uh, welcome. Tell us who you are. Hello, I am Vito Tas Mihelkevichus. I am um, artistic director of Nida Art Colony. And uh, besides that, I am also teaching at Vilnius Academy of Arts and also publishing books and doing various uh, projects, really, mostly related to uh, art and culture. I, I might jump back to your very interesting and extremely varied uh, practice, but uh, tell us a little bit about NIDA. What, what place is it and how long has it been here in this context? Nida Art Colony is uh, basically a department of Vilnius Academy of Arts and uh, it has quite a lot of independence but still it's uh, probably a part of a university level, level art education institution and uh, we are located uh, five six hours drive away from Vilnius where is the main office of Vilnius Academy of Arts and um, this place is running in form as it is now since 2011 March, so it's a bit more than two years, two years and four months. Nida is a small resort town community which, is, uh, which has around one to thousand uh, local inhabitants and it becomes like 10,000 people in the summertime, all the tourist makers, all the tourist, tourist holiday makers, and uh, also art and culture lovers who like to come here and uh, spend their week with uh, concerts of classical music or cinema screenings, or so on and so on. And uh, this place is uh, on a peninsular, um, how to say, spit of uh, peace? No peninsular spit of land, which is a uh, neighbor peninsula because it's too long it's one, and too narrow, it's 100 kilometers long and two, two, from 200 to meters to 4 kilometers of width, so actually it's around 2 kilometers of width. And basically it's an island in the, let's say, political sense, because we have right next to the colony border with Russia and border with European Union, so it's 2 kilometers away from here. Mm -hmm. So basically, if you, most of the people in the world, they need uh, visas to enter Russia. So if you are here without a visa, you are kind of an island because you can go only one way out and then you have to take a ferry for five minutes and you are on the mainland. Mm. And this place, uh, it's a cultural landscape included in the UNESCO World Heritage List. Uh, and why it's cultural? Because it was formed both by, by human forces and by, by, by nature forces and human also forces. And it's basically a, a thin uh, piece of land uh, which, is, which used to be only sand and now the sand was always moving and now it's fixed by uh, huge uh, fixation and forestation works in the, from the 19th century until now. And because of this uh, specific situation being between the sea and the lagoon, which is the sea is uh, salt water, Baltic Sea, and, and the lagoon is a, a lake, it's a uh, fresh water and it's considered to be one of the biggest lakes uh, in the world. And uh, uh, it had, uh, how to say, attracted artists since already the mid 19th century. Because of this all these specificnesses and, and unique qualities. Uh, yes, because of, yeah. basically because of the nature and, and seclusion and you can be like alone, mm -hmm. isolated and um, 
because of kind of wild nature, which is like uh, not wild at all, it's a semi-wild nature. Oh. Since basically since end of 19th century, when all over Europe and USA artists uh, started to look because of a huge industrialization in the cities, we started to look for places where we can live from big cities and have some time for concentration and, and, and creative production. So since that time, Nida was also a popular destination uh, from the, mainly for, for the professors from Königsberg Art Academy of Kaliningrad, which is here only 80 kilometers away. So the students and professors and also some other artists, because at that time it was Germany, it was a part of uh, Germany, uh, East Prussia, and since then artists were coming and staying, and this kind of myth that uh, Nida is a place for artists, and uh, it's welcoming artists and people like to come, and we have good conditions to make art, so this myth was uh, viable uh, through the whole 20th century. Uh, unless, no, actually the, the colony, the art kind of colony which ceased to exist in, after the Second World War because of most of the population were uh, like uh, locked up in the killed war, yeah. the war. Yeah, yeah, so some of them we moved to Germany because we had this right to move to Germany. Not to forget that this land actually was a piece, of, like a, it was Lithuania from 1923. <coughs> After the First World War, it became part of Lithuania, mm. uh, and um, this was Lithuania for 18 years. And um, after this, uh, it started to be Soviet Union after the Second World War, and of course it was a border zone, it was a very strict situation, so it was not so popular among the artists. Uh, because it was difficult to get here. But since I think 70s, a lot of hippies community, hippie communities and some artists friendly to hippies or just students mm -hmm. were trying, were having here like a, we were camping and mm -hmm. just coming for So summers. they were sort of reconnecting to this history Yes, a bit. and this was, maybe we didn't know so much about this pre-war artist colony, but we were also, how to say, uh, seduced by this nature and isolation, and we were coming here and having some uh, meetings. And actually, this place started to be again friendly and welcoming artists in the end of the 80s when the Berlin Wall fell and uh, Lithuania started to be independent. So at this time, a lot of artists were coming and doing some public or nature art projects mm. outside because. Was it, by that time, was it mainly Lithuanian artists, or was it spilling in from, from the no, no, countries? It, by that, no, but due, because of the political situation, it was artists, mainly Lithuanian, and maybe some also artists from Soviet Union, mm. which has, I don't remember, maybe 15 different countries, but, mm. uh, so we were coming here also for holidays, mm. maybe end of 70s, 80s, and, uh, uh, still in the end of 80s or 88, for example, people came here, artists came here to ex make some projects in the wild nature mm. because in the cities they were still kind of controlled or surveilled or censored mm. and outside in, in the, some villages or like with uh, open nature places they could come here and uh, make some experimentation. Mm, so it was like the, a political semi-wildness as well. Yes, yes. So since that, um, since the end of the 80s, beginning of 90s, it was becoming again the artist's welcoming place. And uh, Vilnius Academy of Arts, uh, like of course the main, uh, how to say, uh, uh, the most important... Uh, Art institution. No. Yeah, it's most important, but I want to say that the most important people in, in the academy is professors who are mostly artists. Mm. So we were also coming here uh, on their own. And the academy was trying to find, to buy something. 
Mm. One, one professor in painting who is still uh, vice rector of academy, he was kind of a godfather of this place because he was looking for different places where we could locate, we could buy some property and have uh, this uh, house for which could host uh, professors and students, and artists, and do the uh, plenaries or whatever different art projects. So in, in 1999, it was bought by Vilnius Academy of Arts, this old storage house, and uh, this idea, like it was renovated like very cosmetically and students were coming with their professors during summertime with very kind of rough conditions one shower, 20 people and uh, yeah. etc and they were always looking for different ways how to make this happen how to make it into like place which could be run all year round and host more people and have better conditions so finally Almost after 10 years, we managed to find the fund and write an application. It was, of course, a, a result of a lot of people. And uh, the project was approved and uh, the construction started in 2009-10, I think. And after one and a half year, it was finished and opened as a place, not only for in how say, internal use, but also for open to international contemporary art world and that's why it uh, has an international artist in residency program and also an uh, international education program which hosts not only students from Vilnius Academy of Arts but students from different academies all over the world and also different universities. By this point when it opened and uh, had this uh, ambition? Was it was it stated that it's supposed to be a residency? I mean, was all these things laid down? Yes. The ambition of this this place. Yes. And then you and Rasa came on board. Yeah. So actually, it was your job to make this into a reality, or how how was that? Was so that the good thing about this building is that it was like built specifically for education and for artists in residency program. So we well, already this concept was um, floating around and probably Rasa was she was working with this project um, like a year later than me and she visited some institutions in Norway, Iceland, maybe Sweden, I don't remember. In two thousand ten before when the building was still in the middle of construction. Uh, there was an open uh, uh, competition for the director and uh, I don't remember, maybe 15 people took part in it. And uh, in the end, the board, there was already a board of, of the colony. So the board was uh, uh, making selection and me and Rasa, we got an equal amount of votes. And, then they decided that both of us should be employed and instead of a director they would have to split the responsibilities and make artistic director and executive director. Mm. So that's how uh, we came, I joined the, let's say, team mm. and it was still uh, nine months before the colony was opened. I'm interested in the residences and how it started out and also how it has evolved and how you have reasoned around what kind of directions you want to push it into uh, because I know that you work very actively with the residences and thinking around those. Where, where was your starting point for, for the residences? Uh, what did they look like and, and where are you now in this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so actually we started um, from a very let's try scratch from zero. So me myself, I was uh, as artist and as curator in maybe two free free residences. And Ras uh, hasn't been to any residency as a resident, but she was visiting mm. several of them. So basically, we didn't have any knowledge in how to run a residence. And uh, 
but we had some like uh, knowledge from uh, neighborhood fields mm. because I was um, uh, doing uh, curatorial projects as a curator and also was doing some editing, publishing and, and organizing projects uh, for artists run spaces and Rasa had a lot of experience in uh, writing projects in general and also working with educational projects and also I, I had experience as a like a starting young teacher for working with students so basically uh, I always say now that if I would be asked to start again the same job I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it no because it was it was too hard yeah it was too <laughs> hard to start without any um, like experience and knowledge mm. and we started with a huge uh, ambition so in when we started in March April May we hosted maybe 12 13 artists mm. at once and I had this I was so generous and hospitable I wanted to host as many artists as possible yeah. so luckily we got a grant we joined one project which had a grant for residences and we invited most of the artists with grants and uh, but still, you invited them that time you invited them no no we select we made open call yeah but it was very fast we, we all announced the open call and we had maybe one month maybe less to for the, dead, to the deadline and then made a selection and we invited them right mm. away so and how long were they around for then mostly two months mm. so basically we were also a nice uh, like a taste testing ground and uh, it, so we learned a lot, we did a lot of mistakes and uh, also some other artists learned and did some mistakes so it was a learning process because some of the artists were also the first time in the residence so none of us have it, had a clue what is the residence yeah. and what should it be about yes so First year, I think it was very difficult uh, and this like an intensive learning process. But from the very beginning, I started to go to conferences, seminars, and meetings on residences. So first year, this is maybe two or three. The second year, the same. Um, two or three events organized by RSR, this International Residency Network, and also uh, I made friends with some other residency curators and, and facilitators and they invited me to other events so it was mm. a, a nice learning kind of experience so I traveled a lot and also uh, visited different residences and that's how we started this remote residence network yeah we will come back to that I just want to ask you before we dive into that uh, what, where are you now in terms of uh, your conclusions, at least for the time being, your conclusions around what works best uh, as the purpose of a residence at NIDA, uh, from the NIDA point of view and the artist point of view, uh, but and also in, in the terms of open call, invited people, uh, length of time so but how do you think around this is this is what these are things that work for us so average uh, time span is two months and uh, for the residents but we still think it's, be it's better to have longer residences in the beginning i had different opinion i wanted to invite as many artists as possible even for a short time mm. for one month and after that i understood that all these uh, welcome and goodbye things, introductions and conclusions, open studios, they take a lot of time. So yeah. if you have the same amount of st studio space and studio time, which is like at least five studios, at, at least five individual spaces, and in winter time we can host up to 12 artists mm. in, in individual spaces, private spaces, so this was kind of... Uh, evolving that we have to have less people for a longer time. Mm. 
Yeah, but actually in the beginning I think it was needed to have more people because they spread the board. And yeah, that's they how... talked to their friends and yeah, this yeah. was like established as a place. But then, you know, if there are a lot of people not satisfied, so you have more unsatisfied mm, people. Yeah. Then maybe you have <laughs> less others for a longer time. <laughs> yeah, it's a challenge. So that was a, yeah, that's a two-sided thing. So what works the best? To come back to your question. Yeah, so... And by, uh, in the beginning I was very uh, kind of believing in the open calls, mm. which I think now it's not so, it's not a remedy for everything. You have to make a combination of invited residents and also open calls and also I think work um, since the place is kind of specific and, and uh, uh, isolated and remote and uh, it's really good that the artists make a kind of uh, prayer visits or introductory visits for one, two weeks before oh. the residence starts. Oh. How, do you, how do you think around, because that's something I, I, I've been thinking a lot about these days when I, I'm here, that on one hand you have this situation where you, you have the possibility of allowing an artist to really sink into sort of the residence ship. Uh, you, you said in an earlier conversation that we had that there must be an allowance for things to happen that doesn't really stick to the application because when you come here and you enter into your process things can happen and that's great. Uh, so in, the, in that sense then productiveness is not key because uh, as an artist I can be allowed to, be, to let things happen. Uh, as they, they do. On the other hand, you might want things to actually be produced and things to emerge out of this that are somehow tangible or mm -hmm. can be presented in some concept. How do you, how do you reflect around that uh, yes, uh, dynamic? It's a good question and uh, only our like, learning and experience help to answer this question to ourselves. So. Basically, we, see, we say that we provide time and space for the artists. And uh, the general guideline is that we don't ask them to produce. But you know, artists are uh, these type of people who are creative and it's very difficult for them to stay and not to produce. Yeah. So in the end, most of the artists make something. Mm. It could, it's not always like a fine finished piece, sometimes we try out mm. different um, ways of working and as some other like people have written and told, uh, yeah, I always remember this quote by, uh, like a quote from Johann Pusset text uh, where he was quoting Boris Groys, right, in our days when the market is so, so present in the art world, so the uh, universities, uh, academies are the only place where, it's, where you can have some experimentation space. Yeah. So we started... You take that as a sort of yes. mission. Yeah. yeah, so that's <coughs> also valid for us, that uh, we don't have any intentions to sell the work which is produced here or to show it, to show every work and to find opportunities to show this work. So this means that artists can uh, how to say, escape from their usual practice mm. and come here and try to do something completely different direction or just to think or read or, or discuss. So this is very important.